From the campus of Weber State University in Ogden, the Utah Debate Commission welcomes you to the first Congressional District Candidates Debate. Good evening and welcome to a debate featuring the major party candidates running in Utah's first Congressional District. I'm Carrie Bringhurst from Utah Public Radio, and it's my pleasure to moderate tonight's exchange, which is sponsored by the Utah Debate Commission, an organization dedicated to educating voters and encouraging the civil engagement and exchange of ideas. Citizens in the first district will choose between the Democratic challenger, Mr. Rick Jones, and the Republican incumbent, Representative Blake Moore. During this debate, Mr. Jones and Mr. Moore will be answering my questions, as well as those from a panel of journalists and students. You're also welcome to participate. If you're watching or listening live, send your reactions and questions on social media to the hashtag UTDebates. I'll fold in as many of those questions as time allows. The format for this debate is as follows. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to the questions along with the opportunity for 30 seconds of rebuttal time. And at my discretion, I may pose a follow-up question. We held a random drawing prior to the debate and determined that Mr. Jones will get the initial response to the first question. We'll then alternate who answers first on the remaining questions throughout the debate. So let's get started. And we'll begin with you, Mr. Jones. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you Carrie. First question, um, why are you running for office and what exactly do you hope to accomplish? I'm running to advance American ideals. Um, when our nation was founded, our ideals were set forth in this seminal document, the Declaration of Independence. And in the second paragraph of that, it says, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. I feel like we are losing sight of that. And uh, that's so critical um, because it goes on to say that if governments are not uh, on that basis, then it's the right of the people to alter or even um, overthrow the government. And Alexander Hamilton, in Federalist Paper 22 said the fundamental maxim of Republican government requires that the sense of the majority should prevail. So I really want to protect voter rights as a top priority, and I have a number of other priorities, but I think that's so critical at this time because they are being threatened by a number of states, and there are states that are attempting various types of voter suppression, having people stand in lines eight hours and drive long distances. And then there's also the gerrymandering aspect where uh, the gerrymandering is completely out of control. So that's a central focus of my campaign. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Moore, same question. Why are you rerunning for office and what do you hope to accomplish? Thank you, Carrie and Rick. It's a, it's a pleasure. We've had a chance to share the stage a couple times um, in this process and look forward to uh, sharing the, 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 the same today and, and, and debating. I appreciate the opportunity always to come and dialogue on these issues. Um, after, after a pretty wild first term, my wife asked me the same question. <laughs> Why are you rerunning for this? And, uh, and it comes down to one simple thing is, is I've, I've developed a real, you know, we've had a successful, productive time back in Washington. My team has been productive, um, focusing on being an effective conservative and, and advancing some key policy issues forward. Um, I want to continue on that path. And I want another opportunity to, to go back and, um, and further some of these things. I, I made three major commitments when I first ran for Congress over, just over two years ago. And that was that you know, I would support Hill Air Force Base and that I would be a part of the reversal of debt culture and also an optimistic, positive, conservative voice for the next generation of Americans. I'm thrilled at how I've delivered on those things. Um, if you haven't been following along, Hill Air, Force Hill Air Force Base has been a top priority. It's essential to the first district. Um, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure to be able to interact with all the stakeholders involved there. The debt culture piece is um, it's really tough. I put together a task force of, U of, of northern Utahns, primarily in the Ogden area, to focus on this, and we've got actual recommendations, and I love showing up on college campuses to do that third piece. 
Thank you, and we'll be addressing many of the issues you brought up throughout this evening's conversation. Um, we will begin with following these opening statements. Our first question, which um, will go to Mr. Moore, and then we'll hear from Mr. Jones. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, what is happening with. Um, you mentioned the debt and the conversations that we're having. Many of us realize that the debt is a big issue and inflation is a concern. Um, can you tell us how you feel about the opinion that many people have about the federal government? And that is one reason maybe they're upset. Would you agree with that philosophy that there's a reason to be upset? And, and what can the federal government do to help put people's minds at ease? Yeah, there's absolutely a reason to be upset. We've seen an enormous amount of government spending just over the last 18 months that has directly led, and, and this isn't just Republican Blake Moore on the stage saying this, this is even Larry Summers, one of President Obama's economic advisors, that that much federal stimulus, particularly in the American Rescue Plan, the $1.9 trillion bill has led to an enormous amount, 40-year high um, rates of inflation. So everybody is frustrated at this. This is a tax on every single American. I don't care how much you make, whatever your income status is, this is an, an enormous tax. And so, yes, people are frustrated. Um, they're seeing it play out in their daily lives and we have to be willing to come in and address this. You, you can, you know, we've had, we just passed $31 trillion in debt. The, the, one of the main fundamental issues of why we have so much debt is because mandatory spending doesn't get addressed, and that's been the case for over 50 years, and we've allowed for it to just culminate to this point. But more acutely, you have two different philosophies on how you go about doing this. In 2017, there was a Republican approach to, to make taxes globally competitive and grow the economy. And in 2021, there has been President Biden's approach and there's an enormous amount of federal spending. And one has led to inflation and one has led to better economic growth. The stock market, everybody's 401ks are down. Gas prices are, are, are wild right now. We're not gonna get inflation under control until we address the energy policy that we're facing. And I'm sure that'll be a question tonight. But the frustration that people exist, I wanna be somebody that can reverse this trend and I want the opportunity to do that. Mr. Jones, same question, a lot of frustration about what is happening with Congress, whether it be the debt or other items mentioned. Um, would you agree that people should be frustrated and what ideas do you have to help ease that concern? Well, I understand why people are frustrated. I feel like the media has promoted a myth that has a kind of a superficiality uh, to it. And the, and the main idea is that our inflation is caused by debt. I'm old enough to remember when I repeatedly heard that 40 years ago uh, in the Carter administration. And actually, uh, Reagan came in and pretty much quadrupled the, the debt deficits. Um, Reagan's were 54.5 billion. I mean, Carter's were 54.5 billion over the four years. Reagan's were 210.6 over the eight years. And there was no inflation. And then every subsequent president, with the exception of Bill Clinton, had astronomical deficits. And so we basically had astronomical deficits for about 40 years. And there's been very little inflation. Uh, one other point regarding debt is public debt or government debt is, turns out to be a lot less dangerous than private debt. Uh, the worst catastrophe in our nation's history was the Great Depression lasting 12 years from 29 to 41, arguably. And if you look at the run-up to it, there was no government debt to speak of in that it was pretty much balanced budgets. So um, we need to take a a closer look at this. Okay, uh, let's move on to a question now. We want to involve um, some of the media that's here this evening. And I believe we have Tim Vandenack, a reporter from the Standard Examiner, who would like to ask you both a question. Good evening. Um, Republicans have won the first district race is pretty handily going back for years by more than 35 percentage points dating at least to 2010. Uh, for Mr. Jones, uh, what can you do to make the Democratic 
What can you and Democratic Party advocates do to make the party more relevant for first district voters to chip away at that margin? And for you, Mr. Moore, um, given the Republican dominance, what do you do if you win to reach out to that 35 percent or so of the public in the first district that consistently votes against the Republican Party? Do they get a voice? Well, we do need to uh, challenge kind of the superficial plausibility of a lot of theories that are out there. And it is, I think, for Democrats, an uphill climb. Uh, many of the Democratic economic proposals are a little counterintuitive. They're more long-term. And uh, this has been the way since the Great Depression. Um, in a nutshell, Republican economics is largely based on microeconomics, which is kind of common sense and, uh, and not counterintuitive, whereas a lot of the Democratic ideas uh, tend to be that way. And then I think we need to challenge a lot of Republican ideas in other areas um, regarding federalism and, and our rights and so forth. I've actually tried to do that uh, since the late 70s, and um, I've sent a number of columns to your newspaper. Um, but I think, though, that's a, a constant struggle, is, is to keep the voters informed and steer them away from a lot of theories that have a superficial plausibility. Mr. Van Dyke, thanks for the question. I appreciate it, and the, uh, I will continue to interact with you and all media, and media sources to help spread a message. Uh, I've appreciated interacting with, with, uh, with your newspaper over the last two years. Um, that's one way. Um, the truth is, is when you take on a role like this, you give up the opportunity to be liked by everybody, to be agreed with. You're, you, you have to make difficult decisions. You have a yes, no, and a present, and it's frowned upon to ever choose that present button. <laughs> you need to make decisive decisions. Um, when you're in the minority like me, like, 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 the, like the, the Republican conference is right now in Washington, and you're subject to whatever Speaker Pelosi wants to put on the floor. There's tough decisions. Um, and so I've given up that life of, oh, I can be, you know, I can please everybody. And while doing that, I think I've shown that I'm still willing to show up and communicate to people. I'm really proud of the fact that our newsletter followership is three times higher than anything we do on social media, because that's where we communicate the reality, not the rhetoric. And I have tried to cut through a lot of that, what you see from, to some degree, both parties, and truly speak to what's the reality. That's where you can go ahead and win a lot of that, what we would call the movable middle. Folks that are frustrated with their government right now. And why, why is that? You saw in the Republican convention, as I talked to, to folks, they had never been really involved. They got involved because their prices had gone up dramatically in a short amount of time. And why is that? And being able to communicate that to people is important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to you, Mr. Vandenack. Let's, um, I want to be more specific about what's happening with inflation. And um, as was mentioned by Mr. Vandenack, you have a unique district. There are things that are unique about the first congressional district. Are there things that you would specifically do to help with inflation in this district? Um, I live in northern Utah. I understand what it's like, housing prices, gas prices. Let's touch on all of those. But let's begin with maybe um, an idea that you might have that would be specific to your congressional district and your constituents. And we'll be, begin with you, Mr. Moore. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, the key and the role that I can play here is particularly at a national federal level, because that is a lot of what is driving this inflation and it's affecting every state, regardless of political affiliation, regardless of whatever type of communication or communities you have. One of the neatest things and the thing I love to brag about with respect to the first district is how diverse our economy is. You've got a whole manufacturing corridor. You have some of the best recreation that you've got in the country, the world even. You have an ag community. You have an energy community. Um, you, and then you have a defense community second to none. So that's something that makes it so the first district and generally to, to, to the larger extent, Utah, we can weather 
some economic downturn, we can weather some of these storms okay, but the problem that we're facing right now, the one of the two biggest issues is going to be how we address water shortages and of course growth with respect to housing. Um, the, 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 you know, I can't fix at the federal level how each municipality and how the state legislature deals with affordable housing. What I can do is be supportive of, of several different sort of micro um, infrastructure or transportation projects. Those are things that we deal with and we work in conjunction with a lot of our, our local stakeholders to make sure we're building out a good sound growth plan. And that's something that it's been, like I said, I come, come back to the term productive. It's been a way that we've been able to lean in and be very productive with, the, with, with, with local lawmakers. Okay, and, and Mr. Jones, the same question for you. Do you have ideas specific to the first congressional district and things that could be done on the federal level um, to address inflation for your area? The truth is a lot of the inflation is due to COVID. Um, it killed a million people and then uh, slowed down another four or five million with long haul COVID. Uh, there's the Ukrainian war and it's been years since the United States has aggressively enforced antitrust. This has tended to create more companies with monopoly power that exercise that power uh, to the disadvantage of so many people. And then there's been a long-term trend in our economy since the 1980s, and that is for businesses to seek profit without production. Uh, that's why we've largely stopped being the industrial economy that we once were in earlier eras, uh, why we have a lot more inequality. And uh, what is happening now is that interest charges for the vast majority are growing much, much faster than the growth in their real wages. And so the, the financial sector is growing very fast. Uh, one way to reduce inflation, uh, however, though, is uh, with the IRS, um, this area employs 5,000 IRS workers, and if they can do their job effectively, and that, then that will be that much less taxes that uh, the average person will have to pay. Thank you. Um, any rebuttal on that? Any more comments? I would love to talk about it continually. It's not in, a, in, 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 in as far as a, per se a rebuttal, but if you want to really talk about inflation, if you're going to make inflation the topic, we have to get to the point where we are not spending so much and trying to solve every problem at the federal level. And that's what we've seen from President Biden's approach. Again, the $1.9 trillion um, American Rescue Plan created an enormous amount of stimulus, loaded the monetary supply, it suppressed our workforce, and when you get that, there's only one equation, and it's rapid inflation, and that's what we've experienced. Well, let's continue on the topic of inflation and focus on housing prices. Um, not only um, is the demand high, but accessible housing is also an issue, and then when you do find a home, it's fairly pricey. What can the federal government do, and what ideas do you have for addressing that with your constituents? Mr. Jones. Yes. Um, I think the key thing we always have to do with growth is plan ahead. If the growth precedes the planning, then you have a real mess. But uh, if you can plan ahead of growth, and a lot of that would be on the local level, then things will be much better. I, was in Egypt earlier this year and uh, Cairo specifically. That's a city where they obviously didn't plan much because I attempted to visit a store and I had to cross an eight lane road. And in the end, I never made it to the store because there was no lights and you could walk for a mile or so each way. And uh, then also, when I was there, uh, I was told to never drink their water and not even to use it to brush teeth and so forth. And then I visited a part of the Nile and it was just choke full of plastic bottles. And uh, so we really do have to 
carefully plan our growth and we can't just let the, the growth go willy-nilly. And uh, Mr. Moore, ideas you have for housing for those who are so living let's, in your uh, district? So let's make it very clear that Mr. Jones and I agree that Utah can never become Cairo. We can never become Cairo. We definitely have to plan better than that. Um, so it, yeah, I can actually continue on with what, what, I, what I had kind of talked about. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about infrastructure, but before that, one of the really neat aspects of this role is that you get to interact with stakeholders across various industries. And one in particular has been uh, the, uh, the Wasatch Front Regional Council. In conjunction with that, you also have uh, home builders associations that truly identify and they're, they're monitoring what type of regulation that we're putting them under, we're putting them through. And we could reduce costs immediately if we would just take a few key measures of what we've seen be successful before and just re-implement that. So it's one of my, <laughs> it's one of my biggest frustrations and criticisms of, of President Biden is there was plenty going on that was going well. You didn't have to just repeal everything that was going on. You could have actually looked at a lot of the things that were in place and regulation was something that, that was um, moving in the right direction. And we had very smart regulation that actually targeted some of the issues. So home building here, they, we require an enormous amount of regulation that, 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 that doesn't make any sense, it actually doesn't improve it, it just adds costs. So if we take that out, that will be passed down to the consumer and we've showed how that could be the case, we need to get back to that point. Infrastructure, things like the Uena Basin Rail Project that we've been really passionate about, that's gonna grow the economy in that area, relieving some congestion from the Wasatch Front. So there's a lot of different interesting ways you can be doing this and it all comes back to making sure that you have the right type of infrastructure to promote healthy growth. And did you have anything to add? Uh, well, infrastructure is absolutely critical. In fact, a lot of economic historians feel it's a major form of capital formation. And uh, so we shouldn't uh, begrudge the government when it does try to expand infrastructure and update things and uh, do as like they were trying to do with the IRS where they were attempting to replace technology that was decades old and uh, modernize and uh, go forward in that way. So infrastructure is very critical, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Um, again, let's just again touch lightly on inflation and um, costs at the pump. We know that Russia and OPEC are trying their best to increase uh, the cost of gasoline and fuel and wondering what can you do to help with sticker shock at the pump, Mr. Moore? We can pass my bill that's on the hopper, ready for Chairman Grijalva to pass the bill. He's not going to take it up, I assume, before the end of the year. He's the chairman of Natural Resources Committee, and you have just seen a fundamental breakdown on um, embracing American energy independence to the point where, you know, the key is, is doing baseload power. You know, this could even, this could even morph into a, a, a question with regards to climate, environment, and everything. Doing baseload power in the cleanest, most effective way possible, and Americans can do that. We've, we've shown over the past decades that we're willing and we, we're able to do that, and we need to embrace that more. And that's President Biden with the secretarial order, the Keystone Pipeline cancellation, things like that have driven away investment into uh, our American energy independence. That has given enormous amount of leverage to OPEC and the Saudis to be able to say, eh, you know what, we're not gonna, we're gonna cut production because we want gas prices higher and that's all gonna come and hit us. And it's because we're not doing it on our own and promoting that as much as possible. And Mr. Jones. Yes, well, regarding gas prices, we can't forget that a little over a decade ago, a barrel of oil was in the vicinity of $150 and uh, more recently, it's been in the vicinity of $100 even though a number of other things have inflated. Um, as far as trying to save money and uh, reduce government expenditures, I think we need to look at that with a little bit of suspicion or so. It wasn't that long ago that uh, Utah had a senator for 42 years, and this senator, when he first ran, it was on, I will balance the budget and he repeatedly proposed balanced budget amendments and um, he got to the highest levels of power. Uh, he was actually in line for the presidency and anyway, uh, during his time, the deficit went up about 30-fold, so. 
Are we okay to move on? I would, I, I, there's a couple more things I'd okay. add, just on the topic of inflation and energy. The key way that the Fed is trying to address inflation right now, after they've seen it grow so much, they're trying to increase interest rates, and they're doing 75 bits every, every bips every few months. That's the one lever you can pull. But we, uh, uh, it's going to be incre increasingly more difficult to get out of this inflationary period we have if we don't get our energy costs under control. Why? Because it's not necessarily just the loaf of bread that's costing more; it's the transportation of the loaf of bread to the store for us to be able to address this. And if we don't focus on stronger, more American-based energy production, that again, cleaner, safer, better labor standards than anywhere else in the world, we're not going to get out of this inflationary period the way we should be. Thank you. Let's uh, give an opportunity for a Weber State student to join us this evening and ask a question. Isaac Eck, go ahead with your question. Perfect. Thank you. So student loans and debt are significant problems for many college students. What do you think is the best way to alleviate uh, this debt's pressure on the economy and on students? And uh, let's see, we begin with Mr. Moore. I'm um, first, okay. The question is, is the best way to alleviate student loan pressure? Yeah, so what do you think is the best way to alleviate uh, the debt pressure of student loans on students? Is making sure that our higher ed universities and institutions, going even down to our tech and trade centers, focus on jobs, focus on the next level of jobs, and making sure that our students are prepared to take on those jobs. That way, their investment in what they're doing with respect to higher ed is the most fruitful that it could possibly be. And you know who's doing a great job at it? It's right here at Weber State. Okay? You can go to my tech centers, and the tech centers in the, in the entire first district, from Davis, Ogden Weber, Bridgerland, UB Tech, they are doing something that is exceptional, and the state legislature's been on board with it. What has the state legislature done? They said, hey, juniors and seniors in high school, we want you to get a skill. Go, we're going to give you free tuition and go to these tech centers and then we want you to promote a skill so when you do decide to go to a four-year school, you are able to make a, be a better income, make it, have a different type of job that's even more productive. If, if universities are focused on that, then we will continue to see productivity going there. The way that I have, and I've been outspoken about this, is President Biden's plan to just to forgive ten to $20,000 in student loan debt is not a plan to fix rising costs. And there's even provisions in that particular um, executive order that would disincentivize universities from even doing that because they would just forgive a bunch of student debt after 20 years that you weren't required to pay back. And this is going to make it so it's more and more easy to get easy money, easy lending, and, 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 and universities aren't going to fix the problem. And I'm really proud of what universities right here in the first district do, Utah State included. And Mr. Jones. Uh, well, I'd like to mention, I think one of the solutions to reducing costs actually uh, came out of Utah a number of years ago with uh, Utah Governor Mike Levitt helping to create Western Governors University. Um, in 2015, my uh, daughter called us and said she had a nice surprise for us, and she was going to graduate from Western Governors with a degree in nursing instruction. And she was able to get a job at BYU with that. But the total cost of that was uh, $3,500. And uh, you know, some people spend 50000 for a master's degree or so. So uh, I think it would be probably appropriate for the government then to uh, insist that if students need to go heavily into debt that they uh, maybe take a look at uh, less expensive schools and uh, go that route. And uh, I think that would be a good approach. Anything else to add, yeah, Mr. So Moore? I've done a lot of work with Western Governors, too, so I'm glad he brings that up. They, they, they've come up with a model of competency-based learning, um, competency-based education. And it's, it's a very efficient way to approach it. We're seeing higher ed sort of take on the, those, those universities that are focused on ROI. Again, and I know that the leadership here at Weber State and Utah State and the University of Utah, as that's now in the new first district boundaries, they are firmly focused on making sure their students have what they need to, to go and get jobs and have successful careers, because then that pressure of student loan is, is, is taken off. Um, we just allow to pick and choose who gets their student debts forgiven. Like, that's not a plan. That's just a campaign promise. Thank you both. 
We are at the halfway point of the debate featuring the Democratic challenger, Mr. Rick Jones, and the incumbent, Representative Blake Moore. They're running to represent Utah's first congressional district. I'm Carrie Bringhurst from Utah Public Radio, and we are still taking your questions during this live broadcast. If you'd like to join us, use the hashtag UT debates on social media. So we're going to get back to our questioning and we will hear from another Weber State University student, Kennedy Jones. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My question for the both of you is, what are your plans to make healthcare more accessible for college students who might be living on a lower income? Oh, we are going to begin with Mr. Jones. Okay. Well, I've been in favor of uh, expanding Medicare, I, I mean Medicaid, uh, for a long time. And uh, that, that would make a lot of sense. Our health care costs really are completely out of line relative to the rest of the world. Um, I read an article a quarter century ago, and Toyota was going to come and build a plant, a major plant, in this hemisphere. And they had suitors from Ohio and Michigan and Alabama, places that had built cars. And this seemed like a natural place for them because this was their, potentially their biggest market. They ended up going to Ontario, Canada, because each car embodied more health insurance costs than it did steel. And, uh, I don't know why we need to have health care costs uh, where 25% or approach, something approaching that is consumed by paperwork and then places like Taiwan can keep their health care costs in a way where they only spend uh, less than 2% on, on paperwork. So uh, we definitely need a lot of change in that area. So I can't think of a I can't think of a better population of folks to fully embrace tele, telehealth telemedicine more than university students. You guys are busy. You should be busy. I hope you're busy. You're doing it right if you're busy, and um, you're in an overall relatively healthy population, younger, active, and we have to be able to take a look at some of the things that took place in COVID. To say, hey, let's embrace this. Let's figure out how to go about doing it. I was proud to to to, to be a part of passing a, passing legislation largely bipartisan, um, a lot of agreement on this back in Washington. It was signed into law to expand that for a couple years so we could further test it out and see what benefits they are. I think that healthcare providers can benefit from this. They could potentially see more patients. This will naturally produce um, a bigger focus on preventative care, which is where we need to go. If we are constantly focused on just fixing the symptoms or we get so bad that we're not, then we're going to continue to see our costs increase and increase. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a fix that you've, you know, you've seen Congress come together on. You don't see it oftentimes. You definitely don't see it in the news much on what we do actually productive back there, but there's a lot of things. We could talk about Secure 2.0, but that's hopefully for a retirement question later. Um, there is things that, that we're doing. When you go to the store, when you choose a car insurance, when you do any type of um, consumer activity, you get to say, oh, this is $20, this is you know, $28, I'm gonna choose this. Have you ever done that with your x-rays? No, you've never done that because we don't allow, and we don't encourage transparency and competition enough in our healthcare markets. And that's the key focus of what the commitment to America is, is how do we build that more into it? Because this is our largest budget item and it is going to continue okay. to balloon out of it. I'm sorry, I love talking <laughs> about this stuff. Let, let's see if uh, Mr. Moore has anything he wants to add to that. Jones. Jones, uh, excuse yeah. me. Uh, yeah, well, I would completely agree with that. And uh, I can't applaud the Biden administration strong enough for reducing drug prices, and I think it should be that way for everyone. Uh, a key reason our drug prices are so completely out of hand is we have a lot of pharmaceutical executives that are making uh, in the vicinity of 25 million and things like that. If you go to Europe, there's no pharmaceutical executives making 25 million, and I think we can get it under control by taking a good look at that. I see, Mr. Moore, you have something to add to that? Absolutely. I, this is one of those things, when I said I wanted to be the, a conservative voice for the next generation of Americans, I want to be able to communicate the reality. And 
when we are desperate in need of a vaccine, who did it? Americans did. Republicans were back there in their healthcare policy, and in a lot of ways, they're focused on the root cause. Why are prices so much? Let's go after supply chain. Let's go after some of these other issues that are causing prices to go up so much. That's where the focus needs to be. And we can't demonize the, 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 the healthcare industry um, in one breath, and at the same time, thank them for coming up so quickly with the vaccine. Like, it's just, it's tough. We need to focus on cures and not necessarily symptoms as much. Thank you so much. But, uh, let's continue with some health care issues that are top of mind, um, one of those being abortion. Uh, do you consider abortion a health care issue? And I believe we're on Mr. Moore. Thank you. This is obviously a huge debate going across our nation as we speak and will continue to for the coming uh, months and years. As, as Roe has been overturned, states are having an opportunity to engage in this and, and, and be able to shape policy. My focus on this from the very start has been um, what can I do to, 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 to promote two really important things to me. One is um, uh, protecting life, and I won't apologize for it. And the other case is making sure that women have the resources they need when they're in a difficult situation. So I've co-sponsored the Care for Her Act. I've done virtually as much as you possibly could on adoption. I just introduced another bill um, related to the work of adoption. And uh, the Care for Her Act is something that I care deeply about because it actually focuses on, okay, so when some, you know, child tax credit, would it apply to a baby in the womb? Well, why wouldn't it? If we believe that's the life, then why wouldn't it apply to a baby in the womb? And, 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 and helping find resources when they're in a difficult situation. So. Um, being able to look at both of those things and focus heavily on that is key, and I think we all have a role to play in this. Uh, I think definitely abortion in certain circumstances can be a real health care issue for women. I'm, to be honest, appalled at the idea that a 10-year-old or young children would have to carry babies to term. Um, I, I just think that's uh, that goes against so much of what we believe in, and also, uh, you know, like even if a 14-year-old commits a terrible crime, quite often as they get a little bit older, that is erased off of their record, and it's certainly if a young child is raped or, or so, I think they should have that ability. I also think it's foolish to try to criminalize abortion when about two-thirds of the country do want at least what was available with Roe v. Wade, which uh, permitted women to make the call in the first trimester. Um, it, it just, uh, I don't think it's really feasible to criminalize it then in that first trimester. and you're going to get into the problem when you do have these exceptions that if two 14-year-olds both claim they were raped and one of them is lying, are you going to have a bureaucrat or a little committee determine which one is lying? And that I think it will just make the government overly intrusive and meddlesome. Mr. Moore, do you have anything to add? I, I would add to make sure that my voice is on, you know, I, I support as Utah legislators have, have come to, to an agreement on, and, this, and, I, and I anticipate they will you know, continue to work on this in the next session as well, that situations of rape, incest, a woman didn't choose to be in that situation, and that those are exemptions that should absolutely exist. Health of the mother, making sure we rely on the medical community to help us understand what um, those cases are, fully supportive of that. Both of you have, uh, thank you both, both of you have touched on uh, climate change and issues related to climate change. Um, there must be a lot of interest in that because we took a, a poll and allowed our audience to participate in asking questions and climate change was one of the top issues they wanted to discuss. So we have had a two, at least two consecutive years where we've experienced low snowpack and some of the reservoirs are extremely, extremely low levels. Does the federal government have a role in implementing or helping come up with policy related to drought for those of us here in Utah as well as the West? And it looks like we are on Mr. Jones to begin. Uh, I think it absolutely does. Uh, and as bad as we have it, boy, there's 
other areas that are much worse. I saw a cabinet meeting for the Maldives Islands, and uh, the cabinet meeting was held under water, and they were wearing snorkels and, and stuff like that because some of these islands are going to go away. So we really have to start taking steps to reduce the carbon that we emit. Um, each molecule of carbon dioxide that we create today will still have, will, for every 100, we'll have about 50 still around in a century. And uh, so we, we do have to pay very close attention to that, and uh, probably at some point we'll have to do some steps to really discourage carbon consumption. But um, I, for now, we need to keep the, the full array of, of options open and, um, and make sure that the, the transition is well thought out. Thank you, and Mr. Moore. Yes, we absolutely do have a role to play, and I was excited that on July 31st, right before the August work, the August sort of district work period, we were able to pass our bill through the House of Representatives. I co-sponsored legislation with Representative Jared Huffman out of Northern California. It's called the, the Saline Lakes Ecosystem Great Basin Program Act. It's a long name. We call it the Great Salt Lake Bill, colloquially in our office. Uh, even closer to home than the Maldives, we've got terminal lakes throughout the Western United States drying up. And um, there's a, there's a, we have to take a comprehensive approach at this. We have to deal with things acutely in the near term. We have to be willing to look at greenhouse gas emissions over time. What can the U.S. be doing to lead in this effort? And um, I'm fully supportive, and that's why I join things like the Conservative Climate Caucus. Representative John Curtis has done an exceptional job uh, you know, communicating what the conservative point of view is on this, and, and I've appreciated his you know, leadership on this as I, you know, he, he started that as I was coming into Congress, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have been a part of it. Um, but the, the, the bill that we've got passed through the House, and there's companionship in the Senate they're working on as well, that will provide a U.S. geological study to be able to determine some of the best practices on how we go about mitigating this. And this is a big effect from not just bird migration, which is a huge aspect, snowpack, uh, dust hitting our snowpack. We've got industry involved. We've got arsenic potential. There is, there's big impacts here. I'm thrilled that we're working on it and trying to come up with solutions. Um, and uh, we even have a summit on it, actually. The state legislature and the governor have made it their focus, and it's nice to be able to lean in and help where we can. Do you have anything else to add to that, Mr. Jones? Um, well, it's been proposed that maybe we should purchase the water rights from some of the northern Utah farmers. Um, a lot of the water rights were created in the pioneer era, and uh, there's a lot of farmers that are nearing the age of 70 or so, and in some cases no longer want to farm. And so uh, we need to plan ahead and, and look at purchasing those water rights. Thank you. We do have a question now um, that is coming from one of our online viewers uh, coming to us through YouTube, and uh, that's regarding the violence that is happening in Iran and those press protests aimed at the regime's treatment of women. What and how should and why should the U.S. response, or why not? And let's begin with you, um, Mr. Jones. Um, Actually, I think it's, yes, Mr. Jones. Probably at this point, unfortunately, all we can do is uh, give them our full moral support and uh, use the United Nations and do what we can to educate people uh, about the evils of this kind of activity. Um, I, you know, we have a limited impact in countries like that, and especially uh, with Iran. Um, there are some scholars that have suggested that if we had had better relations all along, and our, our relations with Iran have been really kind of interesting. In the 1980s, um, I think 1985, we sent them hundreds of tow missiles and, and things like that, and so we were arming them at one point, and, uh, but yeah, we've definitely tried to uh, cut them off from many 
meaningful contact in, in a lot of ways. And uh, I, I think it's just a tough situation. They've had some of those attitudes for centuries and uh, they're not gonna be easily undone. Thank you, and Mr. Moore. So and I apologize, I think you were supposed you're, to go first, great. but no, we'll work we're, it out. We're, we're all taking, <laughs> taking our chances here. Look, President Biden needs to run and not even walk away from the JCPOA. This agreement with Iran will embolden the Ayatollah, embolden their regime, and we need to run away from this. It is not the right deal, and it will not provide stability in that region. I love what I'm seeing with protests. Iranian um, uh, nationals, they, the, 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 the Persian people, they got a glimpse, and particularly women, they got a glimpse of what, 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 uh, what, what freedom could look like to them. I mean, the abusive nature of that this regime is doing on them for, for you know, tiny little things that are minuscule, it's, it's absolutely absurd. President Trump, Vice President Pence, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, their biggest foreign policy accomplishment was the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords are what provide economic relationships between Israel and, is, and Arab states. Uh, right now, UAE, Bahrain, uh, Morocco, that is growing, there is sentiment, there's interest there. These don't happen unless Saudi Arabia sort of gives it, the, gives it their blessing. They haven't fully agreed into these agreements yet. But the Abraham Accords have provided more stability and more interaction and more uh, dialogue in that whole region than anything we've seen foreign policy-wise. And the reason the Abraham Accords could exist and why they're successful was because we went away from the JCPOA and we let other Arab nations know that we had their back against Iran. And if we are not, if we are weak on Iran, then those Arab nations won't come and build a better relationship with Israel. Uh, the CIA World Factbook uh, two decades ago considered Iran a republic, Saudi Arabia under no conditions as a republic. And uh, I uh, think we should look with some suspicion at the Saudis, especially considering uh, what they did to Khashoggi and uh, just the way they treat people. And that's one of the nations that is farthest away from our, our values is Saudi Arabia. And the only reason we cozy up to them is, well, they've got oil and money. And uh, I think it's a poor reflection on us quite often. I mean, I think that's one reason why, in the past at least, we've often okay, we're, mistreated we're Palestinians. Time. I need to, I'm going to let Mr. Moore just add one more thought. I'll be very brief, seconds. completely agree. The murder of Khashoggi is just, is just it, it's inhumane as it is just infuriating. Um, we cannot give Saudi Arabia the leverage we're giving them right now with our energy policies. And, and that's a, a fundamental failure that we're seeing with President Biden. And if we can get out ahead of that to be able to have leverage over that area so we can promote peace like we've done with the Abraham Accords, that is in absolutely the right direction. The Ayatollah is not a republic. The Ayatollah is the most dis dis despicable regime that is the most brutal that we've, that we've seen in, um, as they've ever have been since 79. The Iranian Persian people are amazing. Their Ayatollah and their, uh, the Revolutionary Guard are despicable and we need to be strong against them. Well, thank you. And I want to continue with um, some conversation about foreign affairs and I don't know that we could have a conversation tonight without discussing the war between Russia and the Ukraine and continuing to enrage. Is there a role for the United States in that conflict? And should the U.S. be involved in sending trip, troops or other support, um, including humanitarian and assistance? And we'll start with you, Mr. Moore. Yes, and my record shows that I've supported it. And um, it hasn't been an easy, easy um, situation at all. Uh, we are we Ukrainians, here's the, the reality is, is they're, they're winning. They're beating Putin right now and he's cornered and he is going to potentially get more erratic. We need to make sure that we stay on the plan. We are going to defend NATO and we will put boots on the ground if NATO is, is, is in any way attacked. And we will continue to, we need to continue to support Ukraine so we can um, deter and keep uh, 
Putin's influence um, to a minimum and end this conflict. We need to be able to figure out what an end to this conflict looks like. And, um, and I encourage the Biden administration and our Department of Defense to work, work uh, heavily on making sure that we can do that. Um, but Putin's gonna become more erratic as he's facing the reality that he's losing. Um, the, even the, the threat of any type of nuclear situation there is, is, is disgusting and um, uh, it'll, be, um, it, it'll be on us to make sure that we're, we, we, we handle things appropriately so we can um, end this conflict as soon as possible. What about you, Mr. Jones? What are, what are your thoughts about what's happening in Russia or from Russia into Ukraine? Uh, well, I completely support the Biden administration's efforts to bolster Ukraine. Um, I do think that we can't allow Putin to get away with this kind of imperialism and his efforts to control the uh, resources and people of, of Ukraine. I, I do think it's completely despicable. Um, we should just note, though, that this does have a high price tag. And I think uh, earlier we were speaking of deficits and so often our deficits become created when an emergency occurs and there, our deficits are born in an emergency and then very often they persist because emergencies persist, so. Thank you. We are out of time, unfortunately. Oh. We have just enough time for closing statements. Um, we did hold a random drawing again um, earlier to determine that the first closing statement will go to Mr. Moore. Thank you. I am thrilled to be in this role. It's been quite a first term. And as I look back on it, I could focus on a lot of things, but what I, what I choose to focus on is how productive we've been. We've been an effective legislator. We have focused on the needs of the district. Um, and, that, and, and that goes to processing passport claims because the State Department is well behind. This is an all-encompassing office. I love my team, and, and we want an opportunity to go back and, and continue to focus on the areas that we're focused on. Um, we, have a, we have a major issue with our economic policy right now, and I want to be in a position to be able to address that. That's something that I committed to in the campaign, and that's something that, you know, we... Um, it, the, the, if Republicans were to, were to be to take back the um, take back the House and whether it's the Senate or not, um, I'm confident that we can be able to stop some of this massive spending proposals that have led to so much inflation, get things back under control, and then show the American people and earn their trust about what we're going to be doing going forward. Um, it's been an absolute honor, and I look forward to another another opportunity to serve and and uh, you know continue on in this role. Thank you. And now, Mr. Jones, your closing statement. Well, again, I'd like to thank the Debate Commission for this opportunity. Um, in this contest, I am the one candidate who actually lives in the district, and uh, I wanted to just let uh, my opponent know that it's quite distressing to a number of constituents that um, he said he would move into the district and has not, and I've repeatedly been asked to, to raise that issue at this debate. Um, I really do feel like we are at a very unique juncture in our history and very much democracy is on the ballot and that uh, Kevin McCarthy, who would likely be Speaker of the House if, if there's enough Republicans elected, has made it very clear that he has pretty much no commitment to government by the consent of the governed. And uh, his power is a result of gerrymandering and other shenanigans. So um, I, I would like the voters to consider that. Well, thank you, both of you, for joining us this evening. Um, it has been very informative. Thank you again to Representative Blake Moore and to Mr. Rick Jones. And thank you for participating tonight and also for your desire to serve. We appreciate that. We also want to thank our panelists for their contributions and those who submitted questions in advance or who made questions through social media tonight to add to the input. And we also greatly appreciate the many broadcasters who are airing tonight's debate and are indebted to Weber State University as well, as well as the Olin S. Walker Institute for Politics and Public Service for providing this venue tonight. 
Thanks also to Utah Debate Commission co-chairs, Ed Allen and Wayne Niederhauser, along with Eric Nielsen, who is the executive director of the Debate Commission. We are also grateful for the Larry H. and Gail Miller Family Foundation and the George S. and Dolores Dora Eccles Foundation for their generous support of the Utah Debate Commission. Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th, and registration and voting deadlines are fast approaching, so contact your county clerk if you have any questions about making your vote count this election year. And please join us Wednesday at 6 p.m. for our next live debate. We'll be hearing from candidates in Utah's 4th Congressional District. I'm Carrie Bringhurst. Thank you for joining us, and good night.
and, and, and I think we stay the course at what we're doing. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that bridge in Crimea could potentially be an escalation. Um, but, you know, I'm, uh, I'm clearly on the side of Ukraine on this one, and I, I, we need to make sure that we support that. Putin overtaking, um, controlling Ukraine, becoming that much closer to NATO allies is, is far worse than anything that we could, we could see. Um, and so, yeah, I am very strong on it. Now, I'm, not, I'm also not going to get in front of DOD policy on this. And um, being on Armed Services Committee, you can almost have a little bit more weight to what you say. So what the reactions and what the responses will be, we're just going to have to take a, a measured approach and make sure that we, we keep escalation to a minimum. But you did say that if they enter into NATO territory, then boots are on the ground. You said that as much in the debate. Yeah, so if they enter into NATO territory, we will defend NATO. And to what that means with respect to boots on the ground, that's a that's a a, a decision that will be made, you know, not in not necessarily in the Armed Services Committee. That will be made by you know our Joint Chiefs and that kind of stuff and all. Um, but Biden administration, Republicans, Democrats, we're all very clear that we will defend NATO. Do you see an escalation like that happening where Putin would go to NATO? Uh, he has avoided it so far, I think, because deterrence oftentimes works, and it's my big it's and that's the big criticism. You saw a lot of criticism come from me. You saw me being the first member of Congress to put a bill on the, you know, to actually pass a bill, the Afghanistan Accountability Act. Everything related to Afghanistan, I was extremely frustrated with. The thing that I'm most frustrated with with Ukraine was, did we do enough deterrence on the front end? Did we get weaponry in the country when we had a better sense of what was going to happen? That's where my big frustration is. We are working together. Congress is largely united on, on how to approach this. Uh, Putin has not entered into NATO. And let's make sure, you know, and I, I think the deterrence is working on that front. Uh, any reaction, tail end there? Uh, your opponent brought up the residency question. Uh, I expected, I uh, totally understand, expected. Um, you can't take away the fact, you, you, can't, you can't take away the fact that I'm from Ogden. Um, I, my goodness, I grew up rollerblading right outside these front doors, and, you know, learning to, uh, three miles from here, right? Graduated. From Ogden High, I am from Ogden. You can't take. I ran for the first district because of this is where my roots are. I'm a product of of here. They redrew the boundaries, and I always said in my first. And the only the only issue I have is I never said that I am. You know, I'm going to pack up my wife and tell her where we need to be, so it's politically expedient for me, uh, and and do whatever we need to do for, for that. I never said that. I never committed to that. What I what I said was we'll see how they redraw the boundaries. And now the boundaries are about a block away from my house, literally one block away from my house. So uh, folks don't understand that. You know, as the boundaries changed every 10 years, they, they pulled in all of East Salt Lake Avenues downtown. Um, and uh, we'll figure out what we're going to do. We got too small of a house. We got we had a baby in the first term. It's been a wild. It's been wild on the home front, to be honest with you. And uh, we'll, we'll figure out where we're ultimately going to be. Our house is busting at the seams and we probably need a little bit more space and we'll figure that out from here. What do you want to say to voters? Why should they choose you? I've been um, I've been productive and focused on things that matter to Utahns. Uh, we've got, you know, like I mentioned, the Great Salt Lake bill. Uh, I'll always have a focus on what the needs of the district, what the needs of Utah are. And I also am driving towards being a leader um, in building sound economic policy so we don't go through what we're going through right now. When I ran, our economy was operating on all four cylinders, right? It was late, late January, early February 2020. And, you know, Everything, all the wages were growing up across our nation, across socioeconomic status. Right? We were we were seeing the effects of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. We hadn't gotten to the point where our economy grew so much that our revenues covered our, our deficits. Right? And I've been very clear on that. But we were growing the economy, and things were going in the right direction. And you know, COVID hit, and COVID had a big part to play in this. But the response has been um, detrimental, and it's and it's created. Uh, inflation and, and, and again, energy policy and economic policy. We, I want to be a leader on that and to be able to go back and build more influence and get on the right committees, even that that, that focus on those specific items. And um, I already I already have put together legislation that's that's geared towards that. And we need to be ready to go on day one. If we're able to take back the the majority, if Republicans take back the majority, I've already got bills that are ready to go. And they're you know we've already introduced them. We reintroduce them in the 118th and you know drive that forward. Simple things like. A leasing after the environmental review, you got 30 days. That's that's the standard. That's what we've decided to do. Let's enforce that and make sure that we're we're, we're driving American energy, so we can continue to do it more productively, better for the environment, and embolden and, and embrace the leadership that we have here in our country. Thanks.
seeing a movement towards bridging that partisan divide. You get the question all the time, what about that? Is that possible? So I, uh, I'm a freshman in the minority, and I have signed more bills, have had more bills signed into law than virtually anybody in, the, in, in my cohort. I'm really proud of that. You don't get to that outcome without being willing to work across the aisle. Jared Huffman is, uh, you know, one of the, um, he's the, he's the co-lead on the Great Salt Lake bill. He is a staunch liberal, uh, and we still found a way to, to look and say, hey, you've got a terminal lake, I've got a terminal lake, we've got to come together on this. We build a relationship. So I am building relationships with people very similar to what I was always inspired by with, with, with the late Senator Orrin Hatch. No one ever said he wasn't conservative, right? But he found ways to build bridge gap, bridge divide, and find, um, find, find solutions, right? And, and, and we need to see more of that in, in Congress. And, and I'm hopeful that, um, you know, if we take the majority, we're able to, you know, I'm able to show more of how I'm being productive back there. And if Republicans remain in the minority, does that change at all your approach to the way you legislate? Whoo, we don't want to think about that. <laughs> um, and my approach has been productive as I've been back there in the minority. I will keep focusing on the specific needs of the district. There's a lot we can accomplish. Uh, I've been productive on my committees, and you know, it's still the vast majority of things that get, get addressed back in Washington, they're, 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 they're voted on, they, even, they, they, they suspend the rules because it's got such broad support, right? It's passing with over two-thirds support. Much of what gets accomplished is, is that way. Um, if we're in the minority, Still, it's it's a scenario I don't like to don't want to don't want to think about. I want to have an opportunity. I am the ranking member. Potentially have a gavel in my hand, um, and and really drive the right type of policy forward, and and put pressure on President Biden. And I think there's consensus we can do. When was the last time we actually balanced the budget? There was a Democrat in the White House and Republican-led legislature. We're not going to balance the budget. We're a long ways away with the debt and the interest rate that we're paying right now. But we can accomplish some things here if we if we get in that situation. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you all. Appreciate it. I'm always worried if I'm like hooked on to some. You know, and he should be in these things. But he's, he's always out there doing his farming, and he's, he's just treating this as kind of a part time pastime thing. You know, where, he's, where the chairman should be almost at every major event and representing the party. And you're, yeah, I see you all, all over. I'd rather just get you back. Can we put again a recall kind of thing? Bring you back in? Out of, out of confidence, you know? All right. He had to overcome a lot with his first counselor. Right here, right here. Okay, stand by. We all ready? Okay, go ahead. So tell me, what would you like to say to voters, why they should choose you? Uh, again, I really do feel like representative government is on the, the ballot. Um, if you look at January 6th in more detail, the plan was that uh, they would basically say Arizona and Georgia, a couple other states are so close that their electors can't go to Biden because they're kind of questionable. Um, and then what that would do is it would throw the election to 26 states that represent 17 percent of the population and 83 percent of Americans would have no voice. And that's a complete repudiation of the idea that our government should be based on consent of the governed. But why should voters choose you? Like, what do you want to say to voters about why they should choose you as their representative? Uh, well, I think in quite a number of areas, uh, Representative Moore has not demonstrated common sense, like the PACT Act. Um, you know, I know a number of veterans and service-disabled people that are deeply annoyed that he voted against it. And I know he said, well, it would be mandatory spending and that, but why are we making our veterans go to Washington every year 
and beg and get some new authorization and that I mean they gave so much to the country that uh, I think they shouldn't have to do that kind of thing in fact their sacrifices are so enormous that um, I always recall during World War II in uh, 1942 Franklin Roosevelt said if in effect if I can ask our young men to charge at German machine guns then if you're well off if you're making over $25,000 I want to tax 100% of every dollar of that because uh, in fact when I taught here I taught hundreds of students overall and I always wanted to argue the Roosevelt position I never was able to because I could never find one student that would argue the anti-Roosevelt position that the big sacrifice in World War II was being borne by our super wealthy people now Roosevelt said it at 25,000 that's about 400,000 in today's money but yeah he was serious about taking a hundred percent of every dollar over that line and uh, actually Congress said well that's a little much let's go with 94 percent so that's that was the percent of taxation the high highest rate during World War II. Speaking of dollars your FEC filings show that you've raised no money in this race can you be an effective candidate with no money against a candidate who has over half a million in the bank right now? Well, uh, yes or no? Uh, I think it's possible. Yeah, um, I know in the well in the primary, like uh, I believe Andrew Badger raised something like forty forty eight thousand dollars or so, and uh, you know when the vote was finally cast, it really ended up not mattering, and. Uh, a lot of the reason too for my candidacy to be honest is to give voters a choice um, I guess I'll tell you uh, I had never intended to run for this I was going to run for the Utah legislature against Mike Schultz in my area the night before the filing deadline I called Oscar Mata who's uh, one of the state Democratic heads and I said I would just want to confirm that no one's going against Mike Schultz because I don't want to get into the race if someone else is and um, he confirmed that and we chatted for a while and then a few minutes before 10 o'clock I said oh just out of my curiosity who's running against Blake Moore well this will be the first time in a hundred years we don't feel the candidate I, I thought we have such a bigger population today than ever before and we're not even going to feel the candidate for Congress and you know we were not fielding one for the Se Democrats did not field one for the Senate so what that would mean is my neighbors would look at a ballot and the Democratic Party would no more be represented than the Communist Party USA would be represented there just wouldn't be anyone and that that was not uh, acceptable to me and especially in this year and I really do feel like we are at a very unique juncture in our history with uh, January 6th and you know wanting to have a president that where 83 percent of the people have no voice in it whatsoever so. so how do you keep at it as Democrats when each year you lose 30 35 points it's got to be tough you, yeah I mean how, how do you keep going I mean do you think do you think you can well it, you know for that reason I haven't uh, let me say on this filing question um, Glenn Wright who's my, my counterpart going against John Curtis I spoke with him right after I got into it and he said it was his understanding that if we had under 5,000 we don't have to file and uh, I called the FEC and talked I remember it was a young lady I spoke with her for a quite a while and I said so if I haven't raised 5,000 by September then I don't have to file and she said that's true uh, this is kind of interesting it's a lot more work to run for the legislature than it is to run for Congress because you have to put in 
reports every month or so and uh, yeah it's, it's very stressful and they want the names and address and occupation of all these small donors and that um, but yeah if you're doing what I do then it's not really that problematic any other questions thank you sir okay thank you